Jonathan Turner has been very patient <laughs> because his amazing, his absolutely amazing, um, you know, UK Lawyers for Israel, which was recommended to me by a, 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 an academic at Sheffield Hallam University, who's a um, law expert herself, as the very best thing that is happening in the UK at the moment uh, in the Jewish community to defend the Jewish community. And um, I'm not a lawyer, but my dad was a judge in Poland before they had to flee. And so um, I would say I've got a legal mind, but I ha haven't got a non-legal mind either. And if you teach Talmud and things like that, you have to have a bit of a legal mind. And I'm always absolutely blown away by everything Jonathan and his colleague, uh, Natasha Hausdorff and his wife, Caroline, are always doing to safeguard us. I'm absolutely convinced that UK Lawyers for Israel uh, which the president of Israel, Herzog, who, by the way, I met when he was Labour leader in Haifa, is not name dropping. It's much easier in Israel to meet these very important people because everybody is important in Israel. It's a family, isn't it? Those two of you from Israel. Um, and, you know, I met him. I remember at a meeting in Haifa, which is a left wing city, I think it's uh, fair to say on the whole. Um, and I met his father years earlier when he was president, when they had open house over Sukkot. This was 40 years earlier when I was at Theological Seminary. So he said lovely things about Jonathan. Jonathan is not only is he an absolutely brilliant lawyer, but he's also uh, very modest. And that's not always the case with lawyers. I mean, lawyers are very clever, <laughs> especially barristers. Um, they have to be very clever because they have to beat the other side. I mean, you know, and Jonathan is very self-effacing and just a lovely mensch, you don't mind me saying so, Jonathan. And of course, I didn't know we'd be having all these people and that it wouldn't be just about the boy, um, the BDS. But you're going to talk to us about um, uh, things related to Israel. You've been qualified as a barrister. You studied at Cambridge, European law in Brussels and electronics and chemistry. I mean, it's amazing at Queen Mary College, London. You've been a barrister for over 40 years. You've published a number of articles, including most recently an article entitled, quote, Occupied Territories and the Exceptions to WTO and EU um, on the Grounds of Public Morality, Public Order and Public Policy. And he published this in the European Business Law Review earlier this year. He founded the NGO UK Lawyers for Israel only in 2011 and it has successfully invoked laws in numerous cases to support Israel and counter anti-Israel, anti-Semitic activities such as BDS, financing of terrorism, isn't this up to date, discrimination and hate speech, all of which we have experienced on our streets today, not just in London, but in Manchester as well. Uh, UK Lawyer for Israel honorary patrons include Lord Carlyle, who you will have heard of, who used to be the, C, um, the security expert for the government, Baroness Ruth Deitch, indefatigable, possibly the most brilliant Jewish woman in this country today, and Lord Panic, who we sometimes read if we read the Times. Um, UK LFI holds webinars relating to Israel and the law, BDS, judicial reform, United Nations, including Human Rights Council, and these can be found on YouTube. And I want to say now, because there will be time for questions, if you want to know anything about UK LFI, um, NJA, National Jewish Assembly, and or We Believe in Israel, who all work together, please be in touch with me afterwards by email and I'll do, put you in touch. So Jonathan, um, now it's down to you. Thank you very much for sitting through all the other stuff. Uh, well, well, thank you very much, uh, Irene, for that um, very uh, generous um, introduction. Um, and um, may I also say particularly, uh, um, I'd like to thank um, Andrew for that very moving uh, uh, remarks um, uh, about um, Rydale. Um, I made a note to visit there the next time uh, I, I'm in Yorkshire. Um, uh, I have a sister there, so um, it's um, possible that I will be there. Um, and um, I said, we certainly do like um, uh, uh, walking in the, in the magnificent countryside around there. Um, uh, and I, I'm very honoured to uh, be uh, uh, speaking um, on your anniversary. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure I deserve it, but um, uh, I will do my best. Uh, 
uh, as you mentioned, Irene, when we um, uh, discussed uh, doing this, um, the, the suggestion was to uh, talk about um, boycotts, divestment and sanctions and the uh, bill that is going through Parliament at the moment. Uh, and I will uh, cover a bit about that um, because it is important. Uh, but uh, obviously there have been uh, major events since we arranged it. Um, and so I would like to say something, if, if I may, uh, about the law relating to armed conflict, uh, because there's been a lot of discussion and, of course, rightly, a lot of concern, uh, but also quite a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, and I'd like to try and clear up some points that um, uh, people um, ha ha have a better uh, understanding. And it may be that I'm, I'm talking to people who uh, uh, know all about it, in which case I apologise. Uh, but uh, um, we can certainly have um, uh, a, a discussion because, um, a, as with all subjects, um, uh, there's um, uh, uh, a, a, an elementary level uh, where you can say various things and then you can uh, probe more deeply about the more uh, difficult um, uh, examples. Um, now, um, I, I hope this is going to work. Um, have you got up on your screens a, a slide saying international law of armed conflict? Yes. Everyone's got that. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with this area. So, first of all, um, it's important to distinguish between use ad bellum, which is about whether it's right to go to war uh, or whether it's lawful to go to war um, in the first place, and use in bello, um, which is how you conduct the conflict, whether you were rightly engaged in conflict or not. Um, the whole idea is that you shouldn't have to argue about whether the conflict was right in the first place in order to have the application of some rules that mitigate um, the appalling consequences of war and, and try and um, introduce um, some things that will um, limit the uh, damage that's done, particularly to civilians and their um, and civilian property. Um, so, as, but, but just starting with USAP Bellum as to whether it's right to go to war at all, because it does have some impact on um, the um, uh, assessment um, of um, uh, obligations uh, when you're in the war. Um, so, um, the um, uh, as a general rule, um, it's uh, been made unlawful to go to war, um, but self-defence is an exception under international law and remains an exception under international law. Uh, and um, here Israel um, argues, in, in my view, certainly, I, I, I hope in many people's views, that Israel uh, rightly has gone to war in self-defense uh, because uh, Hamas has conducted and its terrorist allies conducted this massive uh, set of atrocities and have threatened to repeat them until Israel is destroyed. And indeed, one of the Hamas leaders has said, and uh, you also find an indication um, in the Hamas charter, uh, until all Jews are killed, all Jews around the world are killed. Um, so um, the um, uh, it, it is a very compelling case, um, especially bearing in mind also that future operations by Hamas, if it survives, are likely to be even more serious. I remember when Hamas first started firing rockets um, at Israeli communities um, in the south of Israel. Um, and people said, oh, you shouldn't worry about these. You're overreacting because they don't cause any damage. They're, they're nothing really. Don't overreact. Um, but they've got bigger and better and bigger and better ever since then. And now they are really serious rocket weapons. Um, and uh, despite Israel having lots of bomb shelters and um, the Iron Dome defense system, when they get through, um, they do cause a lot of damage and they kill people. Um, and, and it is, uh, that in itself is a serious threat. But over and above that, you just, um, as we've seen, um, even if you have a sophisticated system, um, you can't. Um, prevent uh, them if they are determined to get over it and come and, and kill you. Um, so um, Israel's war aim, it's been repeated constantly, 
um, is to destroy Hamas as a military force and as the government of the Gaza Strip. Uh, and I think that's important to hold on to when considering um, uh, the um, application of the law of armed conflict um, within the conflict. Um, um, and, and I would emphasize, although um, there have been some remarks that have been misinterpreted um, and indeed misquoted, um, and uh, one remark which I think was deeply unsatisfactory and led to a, uh, the minister who made it being uh, suspended. Uh, but leaving that aside, the Israeli government and Israeli ministers have constantly said that the aim of this operation is to destroy Hamas as a military force and as the government of the Gaza Strip. Uh, and I think that is a legitimate uh, aim to have. Uh, but obviously we can um, discuss that further. Um, so um, uh, th th that's uh, all I'm going to say for the moment about um, use ad bellum, about the, the um, um, uh, being involved in the uh, conflict. And I want to look at the party's responsibilities um, as participants in the conflict. Um, and, and this is um, governed by international humanitarian law. Um, and um, that comprises international conventions and customary international humanitarian law. But in fact, much of the customary international humanitarian law is reflected in the conventions and the conventions um, that are those of them that are universally accepted or almost universally accepted are evidence of the customary law. So there's a big overlap. Um, uh, so even if you're not um, a party to all of the conventions, you are uh, likely, well, you are bound by the customary international humanitarian law. Um, and if anyone wants to explore it further, um, the it's actually very well set out in databases produced by the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, they've done a very good job of making it clear and comprehensible and easily easy to look up. Uh, and uh, you can find that on the internet. Um, uh, and I, I'd, I'd recommend that if you're ever wanting to look into it further. Um, now, I want to make um, an important point here that breaches of international humanitarian law are not necessarily war crimes. Um, uh, the, the international criminal legislation is, law is certainly part of international humanitarian law or covers part of international humanitarian law. Um, but war crimes require rather more than just um, any breach. Um, because they require criminal intent in order to be crimes. Uh, they require a level of seriousness in order to be criminal. Um, there are specific elements of each different crime. Um, and um, a, a fundamental principle of criminal law, um, particularly uh, or certainly um, uh, English criminal law, but um, also reflected in the Rome Statute of the uh, International Criminal Court, um, it has to be um, proven um, and you are innocent, a person is innocent until proven guilty and proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt um, in, in the common law, English common law phrase and widely adopted and, and also adopted in the uh, Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Um, so when people bandy around the word war crimes, uh, and, and I think it's rather shocking that some lawyers do my, myself, because unless you um, are clear about the full facts, you are uh, aware uh, of the full facts, um, it is uh, very unsatisfactory uh, assuming that um, someone is guilty of a war crime. And, and there are some facts where you um, know that um, civilians have been raped or tortured and then murdered and they're clearly civilians and, and, and so on. That That is a, a, a war crime. But um, where you're discussing um, civilian casualties of um, military targets, and I'll come to this in some more detail in a moment, unless you know um, what um, the target was, um, what um, uh, the our army was trying to do, um, what they knew about civilians present in the area, what they knew about the extent of civilian damage, you're simply not in a position to um, make the uh, necessary uh, assessment. There's a, so I'm going to look at the um, law of 
war of um, uh, armed conflict, um, but that I'm not going to look at um, war crimes uh, beyond what I've just said, because uh, there's a lot of detail in war crimes about the specifics of each offence, and we'll be here for a very long time if I try and get into that. So I just want to look at um, what is regarded as lawful in armed conflict and what is not lawful in armed conflict, exactly. whether or not um, it is um, so bad as to amount to a crime, um, if I can put it um, uh, very um, elliptically that way. A fundamental principle of the law of armed conflict is that armed forces must distinguish between civilians and combatants. Attacks targeting civilians are prohibited. Attacks targeting enemy combatants are permitted, even if civilian casualties or damaged civilian objects are expected, provided attacks are not indiscriminate, expected civilian casualties and damaged civilian objects are not disproportionate to the anticipated military advantage to be gained from the attack, and all feasible precautions are taken to avoid and minimise civilian casualties and damaged civilian objects. Um, and similarly, um, armed forces must distinguish between civilian objects, that's buildings and um, uh, uh, facilities and so on that are for civilian purposes. Um, so you must distinguish between civilian objects and military objectives. And again, rather similarly to the case with um, civilians as individuals, um, attacks targeting civilian objects are prohibited unless they've become military objectives. And an objective is a military object if it makes an effective contribution to military action by its nature, location, purpose, or use, and its partial or total destruction, capture, or neutralization offers a definite military advantage. So to give an example, an ambulance um, is a civilian object, um, but if it is used to transport able-bodied combatants, um, it is likely then to become a military objective. And then attacks targeting military objectives are permitted, subject to the same conditions as set out above. Um, that is to say, um, they must not be indiscriminate, um, they must not be disproportionate, uh, and precautions must be taken. So when is an attack indiscriminate? What does that mean? Well, an attack is regarded as indiscriminate if it's not directed at a specific military objective, or it uses means that cannot be directed at a specific military objective, or whose effects cannot be limited, and consequently it's of a nature to strike military objectives and civilians or civilian objects without distinction. Um, so um, but, but basically, um, if you're not specifically targeting a military objective, it's an indiscriminate attack and, and shouldn't be done. When is an attack disproportionate? Um, well, that is if it may be expected to cause incidental civilian casualties or damage to civilian objects, which will be excessive in relation to the concrete and direct military advantage anticipated. Um, and th this is where it does get difficult because how do you, on earth do you measure that uh, you know, sort of awful choice that has to be made? And um, uh, the best answer that people have come up with um, and you may think that it's not a terribly good answer, but it's the best we've got at the present state of the position, um, is it's assessed by the judgment of a reasonable military commander in the circumstances at the time and with the information then known to the commander of the attack. Um, now, um, several things arise from this. First of all, it's, it's nothing to do with whether the uh, casualties on each side are similar. That's nothing to do with it at all. Um, the, um, you have to uh, consider the, the fact, I mean, in our situation, you have, uh, in the case of uh, the, the current conflict, um, Israeli civilians are um, well protected um, and uh, every effort is made to uh, keep them safe and the armed forces um, are there to protect the civilians. 
in, in, in Gaza, quite frankly, the opposite is the case. Uh, the civilian, the uh, civilians are there protecting the armed forces. The armed forces are in the tunnels and the civilians are on, on top. Um, and uh, the civilians aren't allowed to go to the tunnels, to the bunkers to protect themselves. Those are reserved for the for the ha Hamas and um, um, their their associates. Um, so you're, you're bound to have a situation um, with that um, uh, asymmetry. Um, where the um, uh, casualties um, in Gaza are likely to be um, considerably greater than the um, casualties in Israel. The other thing is you can't look at it with hindsight. Um, it's what's expected at the time the attack is carried out. Um, if it turns out that um, um, for some reason that was uh, uh, unknown to the attacking force that um, uh, there were going to be a lot of casualties, something that happened in a previous conflict was um, um, Israel um, uh, bombed uh, a military target uh, and um, this um, detonated an explosion of um, uh, um, explosives that were stored in a tunnel near there that blew up the tunnel and a whole load of houses on top of the tunnel collapsed into it and there were a lot of civilian casualties in that street as a result. Um, now um, uh, and unless um, that should have been anticipated um, by the Israeli forces at the time of the strike, um, you know that that's um, uh, one of the unfortunate consequences of law of war, not um, uh, um, an unlawful attack. Um, uh, and um, um, you also have to bear in mind um, that law is very that, that, sorry war is very chaotic. Um, and um, uh, particularly where you've got ground forces uh, present, um, it is um, you, people are firing at you. You don't know where they're firing from. It's difficult to see what's going on and so on. Um, and uh, a lot of mistakes, frankly, do uh, are inevitable. Um, it's um, uh, you know, a terrible thing about war, but sometimes um, uh, you, you, you have to do it um, um, if um, you're, you're going to um, survive. Um, and then um, precautions. Um, each party must take all feasible precautions to protect civilians and civilian objects under its own control, its own civilians, against the effect of attacks by other parties. And so far as feasible, um, a party must avoid locating military objectives within or near densely populated areas and must remove civilians and civilian objects from the vicinity of military objectives. Um, so, of course, Israel has done that. It's removed civilians from near the Gaza Strip and also from uh, the northern border, um, uh, including um, uh, Irene's uh, daughter, um, um, in, into areas of greater safety. Um, uh, and um, uh, um, uh, but but um, uh, uh, Hamas has um, um, in the Gaza Strip um, has taken some steps to. Um, uh, discourage and prevent um, uh, 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 Palestinian civilians uh, from leaving, from going to places um, of greater safety. Now, I, I do want to say something here. I'm very concerned about some of the broadcasting in this respect, because um, particularly I think the BBC has repeatedly emphasised nowhere is safe in Gaza. Um, with a, a view to, um, uh, if it's picked up at all, uh, um, discouraging um, Gaza civilians from going to the south of Gaza, which is undoubtedly safer if it's not completely safe. Uh, of course, where there are distinct military objectives in the south of Gaza, where they find that um, a Hamas operative has um, uh, fled to south Gaza, the Hamas leader, let's say, um, they will want to strike that Hamas leader there. Um, e even though it's in South Gaza. Um, uh, so, so, so they have carried out some attacks, but not, nothing like the scale of activity in North Gaza. Uh, and uh, civilians should have um, uh, responded to I Israel's um, invitation. Um, and many of them did, it's fair to say, um, to go to South Gaza, um, or south of the Gaza Strip. Um, and, and then that leads me on to the uh, precautions that should be taken by the attacker. Uh, so when carrying out an attack, all feasible precautions must be taken to avoid and minimize civilian casualties and damage to civilian objects. 
um, and that includes in relation to you have to verify that, that the targets are military objectives, um, you have to assess proportionality, you have to cancel or suspend attacks um, if you find out more information that um, um, it turns out this is not a military objective or you see that there are more civilians than you anticipate in the area. Um, you have to give advance warnings um, or you should um, take where you can, you should take um, uh, give advance warnings, um, including um, advice to evacuate. Um, and um, um, Israel takes that um, and the, uh, the, this whole sort of system um, uh, very uh, seriously indeed. They, they phone up um, people uh, living in a building where there is a military target. Uh, they phone people out and, and say, please evacuate this building as quickly as you can. And they carry on on the phone. Have you got everyone out of there? Uh, and, and so on. You have actually um, have eyewitness accounts of this from Palestinians um, and recordings in some cases that um, um, is, uh, the um, Israeli forces have um, uh, released of, the, of this going on. They've dropped uh, millions of leaflets um uh, on um northern gaza um um advising people to to leave um they send text messages as well to um um as many people as they can find uh, who they expect to be in the vicinity of targets and they have an old apparatus for going through each of these criteria um to check um attacks before they're carried out and um uh, to tell uh, those carrying out the attacks what to uh, look out for uh, and these are all it's all the whole system is supervised by lawyers who sit outside the chain of command um, who um, check whether um, they believe that the um, requirements have been carried out um, uh, and um, um, uh, unfortunately this is uh, has been an extremely and will continue to be I suspect an extremely difficult operation um, because you have this massive tunnel system uh, underneath buildings um, throughout the north of the Gaza Strip and probably quite a lot of it in the south of the Gaza Strip as well, um, although they are focusing on the north of the Gaza Strip. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's very difficult to get at these tunnels without demolishing structures above them. Um, so um, unfortunately, in order to achieve um, the legitimate objective of dismantling um, Hamas as a military and governing body. And, and, and um, I, I should say, well, I, I focus on the military um, objective of this, but there's a, um, it, it might not muster as a, as a legal point, but certainly as a kind of political point, it's also very important. Quite frankly, there are no prospects for achieving peace whilst Hamas remains um, as a military and governmental force. Um, so um, similar principles apply also to hospitals, uh, and, and obviously this is um, a, a particular um, issue. Um, so the position uh, under um, customary international humanitarian law is that hospitals and other medical units that are exclusively signed, assigned to medical purposes must be protected in all circumstances. However, they lose protection if they are used outside their humanitarian function to commit acts harmful to the enemy. And there are some specified examples um, in the materials or um, in um, uh, handbooks that have been issued by various um, well-respected military um, um, uh, organizations. Uh, so for example, there's a, a British a military handbook which sets out um, um, the guidelines that British military forces have to follow and um, uh, there's an American one and um, French one and, and so on. Um, so some of this law you collect from there but also some of it is actually in the uh, conventions. Um, so for example sheltering able-bodied combatants um, is regarded as um, an act harmful to the enemy as is uh, storing arms or munition or shielding military action on the other hand, um, incidentally collecting um, uh, small arms from um, casualties, uh, from military casualties that come into a hospital um, and they've got a gun on them and collecting the gun and keeping it in a, a, um, a, an office or a storeroom until it can be handed in 
to the appropriate authorities, whoever they might be, that is um, flagged as something that is not um, in itself a use of the hospital for military purposes. And you can imagine why um, uh, uh, that, that, that might be. Um, but um, I, in, in terms of uh, what we've seen, uh, for example, at the Al Shifa hospital in, in, in Gaza, I don't know whether you saw um, it's been um, it's tweeted actually um, on our um, on our Twitter account um, amongst other places. Um, but uh, the Israeli Defense Forces did a film um, showing the tunnel system uh, underneath the Al Shifa Hospital, um, which um, it um, has um, uh, meeting rooms um, that's where the lighting and the comms facilities um, are powered from wires that go up to the hospital. So the hospital you know, has its power supply, which is inviolate, and the terrorists sit there underneath, planning their attacks using the hospital's electricity. Um, so, um, and, and of course, the, the, uh, and there are rooms for sleeping in, uh, there are toilets, there are kitchens, kitchenettes, at any rate, um, and, and, and so forth, all, all as part of this military complex underneath um, the Shifa hospital. Uh, and, and this is why Israel had to treat um, getting into the hospital and um, uh, getting control of the hospital as a military objective. Uh, and, and they tried to do it in the um, uh, most, um, uh, I, I should say that the attacking party, e even when a, a hospital becomes a military objective, um, the attacking party must uh, give a warning with a reasonable time limit and must comply with the principles of distinction, proportionality, and precautions um, that um, uh, we, we I mentioned above. Um, so um, Israel had to deal with this obviously very sensitively, both from the point of view of compliance with the law of armed conflict, uh, and also bearing in mind the uh, political repercussions. Um, and um, um, it was ov obviously very difficult, but in the end, uh, they were able to get in with medical teams, with uh, some medical equipment, with um, some baby food, with incubators, um, and um, uh, deal with the situation and uh, end um, its use um, as a, a military asset, um, you know, which um, uh, obviously was their um, objective. Um, Um, so I want to go on to uh, talk briefly about, um, sorry, I'm, I'm just looking at the time, actually, I've taken up quite a lot of time already. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll look um, quickly at um, siege and humanitarian supplies, because again, that's been a matter of uh, great concern. Um, and, and some things here, you, uh, you, you have to sort of think them through a bit. Um, the, the law is that actually that siege is a permissible means of warfare, uh, unless there's an intention to starve the civilian population. Uh, but even if a siege does result in starvation of civilians, it's not actually prohibited as a matter of law, of international law, if the purpose is to achieve a military objective and not to starve civilians. Now, you may well say, well, morality goes beyond that, and um, political expedience and, um, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, other considerations may go beyond that, but that at any rate is the um, uh, um, uh, accepted legal position. Um, and the next point is there is actually no obligation on a party to a conflict to supply uh, anything itself to the territory under enemy control. Um, and indeed, conversely, there's an obligation under international law not to provide economic resources or any support directly or indirectly to terrorists. But um, a party to a conflict must facilitate the provision by third parties of supplies that are essential to the survival of the civilian population, provided there are no serious reasons for fearing that supplies will be diverted to or used by enemy forces, or that the enemy will obtain a military advantage because the supplies replace other supplies that will be diverted <laughs> to enemy forces. And if there are serious reasons for fearing diversion to enemy forces, it is actually permissible to prevent essential supplies, even if starvation 
of civilians results because the legal responsibility lies with the enemy forces in that situation. Again, as I say, you know, you may take the view that moral considerations uh, go further than that, but, but that attenuate is the international law on the subject. And I just briefly want to go through the facts um, uh, on this because they are quite complicated and not well understood. Um, so first of all, as regards water in the Gaza Strip, before the 7th of October, some 9% uh, of the water used in the Gaza Strip was supplied from Israel. Um, but the vast majority, over 90%, came from uh, the sea um, or from um, the Gaza aquifer. Um, of course, desalination was required uh, for water from the sea, and desalination was also required for water from the aquifer, uh, because unfortunately it's been overexploited and um, uh, salt water has entered it. Um, so it is somewhat salty, but um, can still be used with desalination. Uh, and quite a lot of the desalination is actually solar powered. And this works very well because Gaza on the whole for much of the year is a very sunny place. Um, but fuel is required for uh, some of the desalination and is certainly required for distributing the water. Uh, and I'll come on to the position regarding fuel in a moment. Uh, but as far as the water is concerned, there are three pipelines from Israel into the Gaza Strip. Two of them were actually damaged in the Hamas attack of the 7th of October and um, were, were broken. Uh, one of those has now been repaired, so there are now two operational pipelines um, into Gaza, and um, ne nearly 60% of the pre-war supply from Israel has been resumed via those two pipelines. Um, the Israeli government did for a few days say they were going to stop not supplying anything at all, which was their right, but they subsequently considered that was a, a bad idea, um, uh, because um, it's better that they supply water than that they supply electricity for reasons they'll come to. And the problem with electricity is that it is uh, very much used by Hamas um, to launch their rockets and to ventilate their tunnels. It is an essential military supply for Hamas. Um, now, eight out of the nine power lines uh, that go into the Gaza Strip from Israel were actually broken, were, were, were um, broken down by Hamas in their attacks on the 7th of October. Um, and the employees of the Israeli Electric Corporation refused to repair them. This has been a common feature of um, Hamas attacks um, uh, when, when there's a flare up and there are rockets firing. Because the power supply lines come in from the Israeli communities around the Gaza Strip, um, when they fire at those Israeli communities, they are firing at the power lines, amongst other things. And very often the power lines do get destroyed. And this time um, they um, excelled themselves, um, as it were. Um, they, they actually knocked out of action eight out of nine. And one is still apparently um, uh, operative. But Israel has refused to resume supply uh, because of its paramount importance as a military uh, facility. Um, now, many facilities and buildings in the Gaza Strip do have their own generators. Um, but in order to run a generator, you require fuel, of course. Um, and um, uh, the position on fuel is that um, uh, as at the 7th of October, there were substantial stocks in the Gaza Strip, but they were commandeered by Hamas. And when uh, it was reported that hospitals only had one day or 10 hours of fuel left, that was true. But that was because Ka Hamas was controlling it and only supplying it to the hospitals when needed. Um, of course, um, Hamas did supply it to the hospitals. And you can think about whether that was uh, whether it was for the benefit of the patients or whether it was because uh, they were running their tunnel system off um, the um, electricity supply from the hospitals. Um, so um, Israel um, refused uh, initially and for quite a long time to allow further supplies of, of fuel on the basis where well, you've got um, fuel there and it's your responsibility, Hamas, to make sure that the population has fuel um, and uh, uh, that's um, that, that's we're not going to allow fuel in at all. Uh, but they then did allow uh, limited supplies of fuel in through the Rafa crossing to, from Egypt. Um, and, th and that was the position until um, the um, uh, recent um, agreement in inverted commas um, on a ceasefire when rather larger supplies uh, have been uh, uh, allowed in. And then regarding the position on food, um, 
again, it may surprise you, but Gaza is um, self-sufficient uh, these days in many foodstuffs. In fact, Hamas have touted it as an achievement of their rule um, to make Gaza um, sufficient in self-sufficient in many foodstuffs. Not all foodstuffs, it's fair to say, but quite a lot. Um, they did, of course, have substantial stocks as at the 7th of October. Um, it's not, I haven't been able to work out um, exactly what stocks there were. And, and obviously there have been with all the dislocation that you have in a war situation. Um, things haven't been getting through to all the places where they were needed. Um, but um, for quite some time now, Israel has been allowing in further supplies by third parties subject to checks and arrangements to avoid smuggling and diversion to military use. Uh, and th this was, uh, um, there was quite a lot of, it took some time to establish a suitable regime to try and uh, achieve this, but it was well justified. And indeed, uh, they did pick up um, in the checks um, an attempt to smuggle in oxygen concentrators, um, uh, which are, are used for um, making sure you get oxygen into those tunnels. Um, which were concealed underneath foodstuffs in one of the trucks that was um, 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 supposedly going into Gaza as humanitarian supplies. Um, so that gives you an, an idea of the problems that face um, the um, um, Israeli forces and the Israeli government in, in working out how to conduct the war. Right, thank you for that. If anybody wants to ask a question, could you press the hand section um where it's you know it's got a yellow hand and i'll try and get to you thanks or if you can't do that you can raise your hand if you want if anyone wants to ask anything oh johnny yes johnny would you like to ask a question if you'd like to unmute thank you i actually put this question in the chat but my it is as follows in the more recent wars that's to say since the second world war on the grounds that times and attitudes and laws have changed. So in more recent wars, <clears throat> which have been carried out by the West, including the bombing of Belgrade, including Vietnam, including um, Iraq and Afghanistan, have any of the armies involved, the Western armies, been accused of war crimes in the way that Israel is continually accused of war crimes? Well, I, I, I think Israel is targeted for... Uh, special criticism and 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 this is um uh, unfair in its own right i'd like to see established a basic principle of international law um that um um, uh, um objects to um uh, uh, discrimination uh, and, and the general rule has or approach has been uh, that if you're guilty you're guilty and it's no defense to say that someone else is guilty and so on um, but it is uh, so egregiously unfair. You know, it's, it's rather like, um, I, I appreciate this is in a sense trivialising it, but um, uh, you have a, a whole load of people uh, parking uh, where they shouldn't be parking and it's only the black person who gets ticketed. Um, that would be regarded as outrageous discrimination um, and uh, possibly even a reason for um, dismissing the charge. Um, uh, and um, uh, we, we have the equivalent of that all the time on the international stage in relation to Israel. Um, I don't know so much about the Vietnam conflict, I'm, I'm not, uh, but what, what I can say, I know something about some of the other uh, recent conflicts. Um, and, and the UN actually did a, a report in 2021 finding that uh, the typical casualty rate in asymmetric conflict um, in urban areas uh, was that um, there were nine civilians killed for every combatant. Um, now, um, despite reports that came out um, at the time, um, uh, which were um, uh, incorrect, um, I think um, uh, it's quite right to say, um, in relation to some of the past conflicts in the Gaza Strip, when the figures were analysed subsequently, um, it was found that around 50% um, of the um, uh, civilians who were killed were terrorists, were members of terrorist organisations. Um, uh, uh, or participants in, in terrorist uh, activity. Uh, this was found basically because um, if you're Hamas, you want to actually claim your martyrs um, and uh, say um, they, they, they died uh, for, for, for the homeland and so on, died for uh, the people. 
Um, and, and so the names do eventually come out and, and then you can do, uh, you can work out um, uh, which ones were uh, uh, um, terrorists and which ones were not. Um, and um, uh, the, the uh, people have blamed the Gaza Health Ministry and said, well, it's just Hamas and uh, you can't believe a word they say. But actually the overall figures um, uh, that they produced, they came out with in previous conflicts were um, not far off the Israeli estimates um, and probably correct. Um, but where they went wrong was um, in the uh, number of people they said were terrorists and the number of people they said were civilians. Um, and it's not surprising they went wrong because um, if someone, uh, Hamas and other terrorists um, typically do not wear uniforms except when they're on special parade. So um, a casualty comes into a hospital, either dead on arrival or dies soon after, um, and is duly recorded by the hospital. And all the hospital is uh, someone who has someone who comes in in trousers and a T-shirt and bloody. Um, and um, uh, unless they've got reason to suppose um, that they are actually Hamas um, or other terrorists, they're going to record them as a civilian. So it's not surprising that the Ministry of Health figures um, give uh, an inflated total of civilians and a deflated total of uh, terrorist casualties. So, so those figures that came out of the breakdown in previous conflicts were wrong. In the present conflict, they haven't even attempted to distinguish between civilians and terrorists. They've just said there have been so many casualties. And, and although people have queried the figures, my personal view is that they could well be correct. It wouldn't surprise me if there were around 15,000 casualties. And every casualty is a tragedy. And, um, you know, once, I'm very sorry about that. But um, there, there is an imperative military objective to um, um, destroy Hamas. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, it cannot be done without, um, I'm afraid, a significant number of civilian casualties. Um, but it's certainly more, uh, Jeremy Bowen said airily, um, it's unlikely to be more than 10% were terrorist casualties. I, I think that's um, um, a completely unwarranted and unfounded assumption. Um, and um, my, my, my guess, I, it may be that it's not as much as a half uh, this time because uh, they've been launching a, a more difficult operation uh, to try and get at all these tunnels. Um, but uh, I, I, I would be surprised if um, it's less than several thousand based on what I've seen from studying the data in past uh, conflicts. Several thousand that were terrorist casualties may not be as much as half, um, which would be 7,500 or, or whatever. Um, but but I think it would be, say, 5,000 or whatever. Thank you. Um, Tom, did you want to ask something? Don't want to unmute. I'll, just, yeah, I'll unmute myself. I'll also, because my connection's very poor, I'm going to go off video because my connection's poor. So um, I'm going to stop my video. Um, thank you. Jonathan, that was excellent. Thank you for giving us such a rigorous silver side on some legal principles. Um, and obviously, you've got a lot of legal background. About 40 years ago, I was introduced to a, a very well-known Jewish lawyer called Peter Berenson. And Peter Berenson, 60 years ago, set up Amnesty International. Um, and he did that in the light of the uh, human rights violations he saw happening in different countries across the world, not specifically related to Israel at this time. Now, clearly, Amnesty now is a very strong critic of what's happening there. So I'd like you to just take a step back and, and ask yourself, how do you respond to their position? Um, looking at the Human Rights Act, International Human Rights Act, which came into force at a similar time as the formation of the State of Israel, and how you see the human rights argument being responded to by, you know, and, and you, you're doing it now, to strong human rights organisations who take a different stance. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you got all that, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was just wondering what you were referring to with the International Human Rights Act. Um, I, I mean, there was the um, uh, a Declaration of Universal Human Rights um, of the United Nations, um, subsequently, of course, the European Convention on Human Rights, um, and uh, there were also the Geneva Conventions um, of um, uh, 1948. Um, uh, but... Um, uh, I, I, 
Amnesty's um, factual analysis um, is is deeply problematic um, uh, and um, uh, unsatisfactory. Um, uh, and um, you know, basically, I don't, I don't accept most of what they say about Israel. Um, can, can I just say something here? Uh, can you hear me? Um, when I was very young, you know, 19 or 20, I worked for Amnesty International. Uh, you know, they didn't mind Jewish people like me working for them then. And I actually got a reference from the chaplain, Chabad, from Cambridge University, where I'd been studying. And I, some of you know that I went on to found the first support, um, wasn't exactly a charity, probably an NGO or support group for Burma, for which I was invited to the Nobel Peace Prize for Aung San Suu Kyi. Because I know German, in the early 90s, I was invited to Berlin um, and I'd studied German at university and uh, Tübingen, actually. Um, and, um, you know, I, I went to, to Berlin and I noticed how well the Burmese refugees were being treated by the German government. And um, the United Nations and Amnesty did a joint talk in German to everybody there. And they said there's only one country that that awful regime in Burma, which was really bad, it was called the Slork, is similar to, and that is Israel. These were Germans. These were Germans saying, I was there as a Jew. I'd given up really my academic work. I was still living in Liverpool to do this. So I just let rip. I just let rip. And in 1994, five, I realized that it doesn't matter what you throw at them factually. Basically, they're always going to hate us. And it doesn't, I mean, Jonathan has to give you facts because he's a lawyer. One of the things we do in our group is look beyond that. Why are so many Christian clergy, the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury and others, so-called human rights groups? I saw uh, Douglas Murray on Israeli television interviewing the Red Cross when they would not answer questions as to why they hadn't done more. And they were getting things through the phone. We are, we are very objective. We cannot do more. I met the Red Cross at the Nobel Peace Prize. They told me openly they hate Jews. This was the head of the international at the time. Um, you know, same with other groups that have won these Nobel Peace Prizes. The fact is, we are working with hands tied behind our backs. And that's why I said such a lot about Bishop Nigel, who did so much politically in this in Greater Manchester, he set things up that had never been set up before. Everybody that was Jewish in Manchester agreed with me. And now we have our hands tied behind our backs. So when I came back from Israel, 2008, the, um, or perhaps a bit later, the bishop was now the, uh, I think he was chair of Bolton University, which, you know, Bolton is a university in Bolton where at least one or two of our group come from. And the Times had said that Jews can only go to four universities in this country out of 150 because all the others are anti-Semitic. And he rang me up and he said, right, I'm now the chair. Can you look into anti-Semitism for me? So I rang up the Anglican chaplain at Bolton University and I said, what are things like? Because she had been a student of mine at the University of Manchester in Jewish history, a subject I started. Do you know what she said? She said, oh, it's great. Hanukkah's coming up and the imam chaplain at the university has given permission to the Jews, if they behave themselves, to light Hanukkah candles. So that is, for those of you abroad, is what we are dealing with. That is what we're dealing with. Amnesty is horrific. So are all these aid agencies. I put it down partly to the fact that at universities, there is no longer objectivity in anything. It's all postmodern. Um, anything goes. And it really is like that. You know, so this is what I'm trying to say, that you can't really argue. I mean, Jonathan has kept off saying the horrors that took place in the Kibbutzim with left wing peace nicks that worked with Gazans, who, some of whom had been coming in for 30 years to work there. And they betrayed these people. You know, I'm reading the Israeli press to Hamas. So this isn't just under Likud, this is under Labour. Perez, um, um, Rabin, perhaps in the wrong order, and Barak, all these people that are now getting at the elected government at the moment. So sorry for all this, but I'm telling you that we have got no real friends here except one or two papers that the government doesn't really, um, you know, look at. And also the BBC banned Jewish staff from going on the march in London 
against anti-Semitism, but they allowed them to go on the march that was pro-Palestinian. So they said the march was controversial. So this is what we're dealing with. The march against anti-Semitism, which was peaceful, is, is you know, I'm just going by what I'm reading in the Daily Telegraph and, and, and other times, other papers, even The Guardian, actually. Right, sorry about that. Any more questions? Yeah, Malcolm, yep. Um, just, I put my question in the chat, in fact. Right. I've now currently lost the question. <laughs> Uh, and Jonathan, I was very grateful to you um, for such a measured and really helpful explanation of the situation from a legal point of view. Uh, the question really is about where do you see it leading? Uh, and and all the questions of proportionality and so on and how they're measured, uh, in the end, history will tell uh, on the basis of where it where this leads us. Uh, what kind of outcome, I think, are we to hope for and and um, what kind of peace? Because that, that seems to be such an important thing, even now in the midst of the conflict. Yeah, well, absolutely dreadful, though it is. And, and uh, you know, so many casualties, so much uh, hardship, so much trauma and the hostages as well. Uh, despite all that, um, it is possible that this will actually lead to a better future because I think um, there is no prospect of uh, peace whilst Hamas remains um, in government and uh, with a military force. Um, if Hamas is removed uh, and if um, eventually um, some um, um, satisfactory Palestinian administration is restored to the Gaza Strip, um, then I think there would be a possibility of progress. Um, uh, and, and it would actually, um, you know, pa pa um, very paradoxically, I, I, I think, um, um, you know, the, 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 the appalling evil of um, the uh, Hamas attack may, may actually um to turn out to um have, have a beneficial um um historical outcome um uh, and um you know yes the you know the 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 needs to be compromised um the um oslo accords remain um in in force and they flagged various key uh, issues that uh, need to be resolved um, Jerusalem borders, refugees, um, security, and, and, and settlements, um, uh, and um, th th those do have to be resolved. Well, there's one other thing that I would mention, which I think is also quite important, um, which is not widely known um, in this country. Um, a Palestinian news agency, the Shafa um, news agency, uh, carried out a um, poll um, of 1,200 Arabs in East Jerusalem and found that 93% of them um, prefer a continuation of Israeli rule of the United City. And I think that really does need to be taken into account that the overwhelming majority, it would appear, of um, both uh, major ethnic and religious communities, I suppose, as well, some of those uh, Arabs would be Christians, um, but um, majority Muslims, um, actually may well favour um, a um, continuation of a united city um, under Israeli rule, although it would certainly be desirable to have um, uh, uh, um, a special um, input from um, the, the Arab side, and of course desirable for the Arabs to actually uh, vote and have more representatives um, on the uh, Jerusalem Council. Um, but, but I think that is an important factor to be taken into account. As far as the, you know, I think the position of Palestinian opinion on the rest of the West Bank and um, in the Gaza Strip um, has been and is rather different from what I can tell. Um, and and uh, I, as a trademark lawyer, I'm well aware of the, uh, that, that you have to be very careful with opinion polls. 
Um, but, but, but nevertheless, you know, I, th I think there the, the does need to be new thinking. And when one talks about self-determination, you know, I, I think people do have to remember that um, uh, self-determination is, is based on what the people want. And, and what the people want isn't necessarily um, what um, the, the, their leaders say, particularly when those leaders have not been um, elected um, uh, or were last elected 20 years ago um uh, and um uh, may, may, may not truly be reflecting um the, the the position um so 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 i think um that, that that's another major point i'll make is, is more attention being uh, made um to to what people really want um in in an attempt to um um move forward um but but yes i mean it's it's it is going to need um um a, a, a lot of um uh, care and, and and attention um yeah well i mean whoever whoever um on that side you know takes over must no longer be a threat to israel um i suppose some of you have read about the lynching of two um palestinians in the west bank by fellow palestinians yesterday who they or the 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 they accuse of working with the Israelis without a trial or anything. So I mean, you know, whether it's true or not, I don't know. There has been privately to me a question about uh, somebody has made a statement that Amnesty International were actually involved in tearing down the posters of the hostages, uh, which, if true, you know, just confirms what we've been saying. But the other question she's asked me to ask you, if you can, is how can it be proportionate that for every um, hostage that is released from, you know, that's, that was, uh, you know, stolen away and whatever uh, from their from their families and the butchered and all that to Gaza, a lot more um, Palestinians and, you know, are being released. That person doesn't think that's fair at all, as, you know, that Israel was not culpable in this um, case. But um, well, there's two differences. One is the numbers, um, mm. the disparity mm. in numbers, but also um, the um, uh, many of the hostages uh, seized by Hamas were completely innocent civilians. Indeed, as you've said, um, some mm. of them went out of their way to try to help um, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip um, mm. and uh, promoted uh, a peace agenda. Um, uh, so wh whereas... Um, uh, the um, those who are being who are held in Israeli prisons, even if they've not been convicted, um, are, are held because um, there is uh, evidence, and, and they are innocent until proven guilty, as I said earlier. But nevertheless, um, they they are are there because there is um, evidence, and, and they in most of the cases they're awaiting trial um, uh, rather than ones who are uh, just uh, uh, are, not, are not going to be charged because. Um, trial is too problematic because the evidence is um, uh, too secret uh, and, and so on. Uh, so, so there are mainly people who are uh, awaiting trial on serious charges. Um, and um, uh, that, that, that is a, a very different thing um, to those civilians against whom there are no charges um, are, are, are applicable. Um, and, and yes, I mean, it's, it's not fair, but um, uh, on the other hand, um, 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 Israel does uh, value um, the, the lives of its people, uh, and um, it's very important to um, uh, to get them back. Um, but but I, I hope it will not detract from the really important objective of getting rid of Hamas, um, and, you know, because we cannot move forward and are at grave risk of moving backwards and. Um, uh, having further terrible atrocities committed if we don't get rid of Hamas.